Some of you will know me from the book lounge and from Moonlighting for Readers' Day in almost every free comic book day. My qualifications for chairing this event are a deep and abiding love of comics. I'm a founding member of a highly respected comic book club. There's one of them. <laughs> I, um, and I have a wardrobe overflowing with comic book t-shirts. So it is with effervescent and somewhat surreal delight that I'm up here with these highly esteemed gentlemen of the comics book world. My carry prolific comic writer and creator and teller of tales. Some of his work includes Lucifer, Hellblazer, X-Men, Faker, Crossing Midnight, The Unwritten, Suicide Risk. Those are just but a few. And then next to him we have Sean Isaacson, local superstar comic book artist and freelance illustrator. He has done work for tabletop RPGs, Mutants and Masterminds, Dynamite Pathfinder comics, and of course, he is the co-creator of the highly anticipated new comic series, Stray. Woo! Welcome! It's a Welcome, mouthful, comic eh? lovers! Okay, to start off with, I thought we would just go right back to the beginning. Um, tell me about your relationship with comics as kids. Sure. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, well, I, I basically got into comics because my folks, um, my father was a huge Green Lantern fan, so he had like all the first round of Green Lantern. My mom was into like <coughs> Enemy Ace and uh, Magnus Robot Fighter, and I used to kind of read their comics back then. Of course, they ended up getting rid of them because they didn't know they'd be worth so much. <laughs> much to my dismay, I was like, why, why? Um, I've, I, my, I've actually got. Um, some original artwork from when I was a kid, that when I was like five years old, that I drew of uh, Batman, Spider-Man, and Superman. Of course, they don't really look like that. <laughs> it's more like Spider-Man is like red with like squares all over, and then Superman has like a Z-shaped thing on this blue background, and they're all in the back of my parents' cigarette boxes. <laughs> so Why I started cigarette with, boxes. Because my parents, my family's heavy smokers. I don't, because I'm like I'd like to live a little bit longer. Um, so like I would draw on everything when I was small, like even in, I think grade, one of my earliest memories was in like grade two, I tried to copy a John Romita senior Spider-Man panel, but I drew it like this big. And my teacher was like super excited. She was like, oh, this is so good. And she put it on the back wall and I was so proud of myself. And pretty much since then, I've been like reading comics my whole life and I spend way too much money on comics every month. <laughs> Um, my parents were also heavy smokers, and crucially, cru crucially, crucially for my comics career, they were also gamblers. Uh, I'll, 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 <laughs> I'll explain that comment in a moment. Um, I fell in love with comics age three. Uh, there was a comic done by a, a British guy, Leo Baxendale. Um, you may not have heard of him, but you will have heard of some of the characters he created. He created the Bash Street Kids for the Beano. Oh, um, yes, yes. And he was one of the earliest artists to work on Dennis the Menace. Um, when I was three, he broke away from DC Thompson, uh, the, the, the publishing company that did the Beano, the Dandy, the Topper, the Beezer, you know, most of the, the, the comics, comics for little children. And he went to Fleetway, and they gave him his own comic book, which was called Wham! Exclamation mark. Um, and my parents brought me the first issue, and I, I just got completely hooked, and that, that was the start of a lifelong love affair. And then at a certain point, I discovered the American comic books, which were available very, very sort of haphazardly in Liverpool. You'd go to, every shop had different stock. So if you were trying to follow one title, like Batman or Daredevil or whatever, you had to sort of trek around, trek down the road and find the shop that had it in. Um, and then at a certain point, I started drawing comics. I can't draw. This is the difference between Sean and me is I, I have no artistic talent whatsoever. But I used to draw comics for my kid brother on betting slips that came from the um, the, ho the horse. Uh, the horse there you racing. go. So basically, uh, you just draw on whatever's available. Yeah, right? absolutely. So there's just these little badly cut squares of paper. I did thousands and thousands of pages of comics, and because I couldn't draw people, I drew eggs. Um, <laughs> my characters were just eggs with the little arms and legs sticking out. So um, that, that 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 was when I sort of first became a, a comics creator at about age 12 or 13. I never looked back. No, I mean I get I get that whole like walking around thing, because there weren't many comic books, comic shops as there are now, like in, in SA. Yeah, specialty so. stores didn't exist. Yeah, so basically the only way you could get comics was you go to like your local like news agency, like CNA. You go here or CNA or like the little cafes on the corner. There'd be like a little 
like spindle spin thingy. Rack. Yeah, a spin, spin a rack. Spin a rack, yes. And there'd be like certain issues. And I used to, I used to, as a kid, I would pretty much spend like every Sunday, like walking in like a five kilometer radius to like each one. And I would never get like consecutive issues of things. I'd pick up something, I'd be like, I'd never know what's gonna happen in the next issue. So I just like read it as like a whole story and be like, okay, this is probably gonna help me how it ends. You know, so you go out from one store to the next, one store to the next. And I never used to take um, like lunch. I used to ask my parents for like lunch money at school. And I'd be like, oh, Mark, can I have some, some pocket money to get some sweets at school and stuff. But I never used to buy sweets when I was at school. I used to steal all my friends' food, their lunch. <laughs> when, my, when they weren't looking, open their bag, like, I'll take a sandwich out of here. And at the end of the week, all my, all my pocket money, all my lunch money, I would save up. At the end of the week, I'd go buy comics with it. <laughs> but that, 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 is, that had exactly the same experience. And that was why, as a kid, I preferred DC comics to Marvel. Because the DC stories were always done in one issue. You, 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 pick up, you pick up a Fantastic Four and it would end with them about to die in some awful way and you'd never find out how it, how it came out. So obviously then comics was interest from when you were kids. Uh, did you think then, while you were children, that this would be what you would dedicate your life to? Well, I originally wanted to be Indiana Jones. Ah. Okay. But then I was like, the, the, the reality of being a, um, uh, like, what do you call them? The, uh, archaeologist. archaeologist to Reality. like Indiana Jones. I'm like, I'm like yes, I want to I get a fedora and a whip and that's going to be my profession. And then it's like, yeah, I know, that's not actually how it works. You sit in a classroom with people and maybe if you're lucky, someone will sponsor you to go somewhere. And then I was like, well, I've got to find something else, so I might as well draw comics. I, I never had the, um, the concept when I was younger of comics as, as things that people made. You know, they were, they were inconceivably exotic things that sort of dropped into your life from, from a far distant place. You know, the American books, they, they, they were just a given. The, the idea of working in that industry was, 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 would have been totally alien to me. Um, well, I've read, Mike, that you were a teacher. I was for, for, fi for 15 years. Yeah. Oh, wow. what, what did you teach? I taught um, English, uh, English literature, media studies and communication, mm. uh, mostly to kids at the very top end of the education, um, of, the, of the, um, the public education system just before they took their last public oh, exams okay. and adult returners. So then how did that segue into comics? Um, I also read that you did a lot of comics journalism. Is that then, when did that become you writing your own stories? Um, it, it happened very, very gradually. I mean, I, I was, I was, that was the time when I was sort of trying to get novels published. I was writing these, these we were talking about this the other night, I wrote these awful novels and sent them off to publishers who bounced them straight back at me. Um, but I did also, yeah, I did a lot of comics journalism, very, very um, amateur comics journalism for, for um, fanzines. And th at that point, this is how long ago it was, there was more than one comics distributor uh, in, in Britain. There were five, in fact. Now it's just Diamond, and if Diamond don't distribute you, you can't do comics. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the smaller distributors was Neptune, and they decided briefly to start their own line of comic books, and they gave the job of senior editor to the guy who was the editor on one of the fanzines that I wrote for. So suddenly I had, you know, I had my foot in the door. I knew the guy who commissioned the work. So I bombarded him with, um, with pitches, and he, he, he accepted two pitches from me, a superhero story, called um, Aquarius, which was just sh a shameless rip-off of Watchmen. It was just watch, watch, <laughs> Watchmen with the numbers filed off. Um, oh, well, that, that's okay, because Watchmen was the, was the Charlton characters anyway. With, yeah, with the numbers filed off, that's <laughs> true, yeah. yeah. Um, and then the other one was a, a horror story called Legions of Hell, which is about a schizophrenic woman uh, trying to uh, avoid being lobotomized, being chemically lobotomized. Um, and the, the interesting thing about that was the character of Jill Presto in Lucifer mm -hmm. originated in Legions right. of Hell. She was the only thing to come out of it. Because the, the, the company then went bankrupt before they could publish any of my stuff. But, uh, but that was my, my, okay. my sort so of that was intro. your entry into it. And Sean, I read in my Google sleuthing of you that you lost your job and that precipitated your entry into full-time comic illustrating. Is this true? Uh, <laughs> is this true? Wow! <laughs> I'll give you the sort of abridged version. Um, like I've always wanted to draw comics, so like when I was working, I would end up going to like my nine to five job. Get what, was get the, what was the job? Um, no, just graphic design graphic for design. like a local for like a publisher. Mm -hmm. um, and um, like I'd end up working there, and then I'd get home, make dinner, and then sit and just work on comic stuff or drawings until eleven o'clock at night, and then go to sleep, and that just marked my day, like on average and stuff. Um, then about four years ago, like I got retrenched, lost my job, and I was like, okay, well, 
no, I need no. to I need to do something. No one's hiring. I look, try to look for some graphic design jobs, even though I hated graphic design anyway. <laughs> no one was hiring. I wasn't doing anything. So like for the first year, it was like tough. Hey, I was doing like commissions for like art collectors online. You know, like they like original mm -hmm. comic art. So I was doing those, and I was making between like like a thousand to three thousand rand a month if I was lucky. So like it was kind of like well missed a couple of car payments, couldn't afford insurance, couldn't afford this and this and this. And then like for like after about fourteen months, I got my first like real like big job, which was like storyboarding. Mm -hmm. You know, and I kind of used that and then just kind of created relationships with people online that kept on coming back for more art or like they had like their own characters that they just wanted to see someone visualize for them. And um, like kind of over time, I just I was online and I saw like there was a there's a online comic called Gutters, which basically like almost makes like weekly it does this funny like parody thing of comics like what's happening in comics so it'll make like a joke so for example when the comics code disappeared there was the the one comic strip that they had was um you saw Clark Kent and Lois Lane in the in the office and Lois Lane is like hey the comics code authority is gone and Clark is like give me one second and he goes into the the, the closet room changes into Superman he flies off and um he goes like you see the, the Lex Luthor building over there, and you see like Lex Luthor turns around, and Superman standing outside, and he's like, "F you!" <laughs> <laughs> Finally, so they, they do that kind of thing, like tongue in cheek and whatever. And I saw that they were they were like taking samples, and if it was good enough, they'd pay you four pages. So I was like, "Well, that's that's going to be really helpful." So like I sent them, and they're like, "Okay, cool." And they give you like cra they give you like crazy turnaround times, like six hours or something, to try and turn over a page. And so I did a couple of them and I managed to like get a couple of bucks from that. And it turned out I think that the, one of the editors from there ended up going through to Dynamite and kept my name and then said like, whenever something came up, he's like, hey, do you want to try, try out for this? And I tried out for a couple of jobs and like the creators didn't like my style or whatever. And then I managed to land the Dynamite gig. But um, before that, I managed to like send samples to Marvel. And it was really cool. Like they, 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 at first I sent it to um, C.B. Spolsky. And he put me on to, I think, uh, Bonelli Magno before he left. And they were like checking out my stuff. And they'd send back like crits. It's like, okay, it's great, but your characters are a bit inconsistent. So kind of work on your faces and try and make them consistent and stuff like that. And after a while, I think I sent like 12 pages of samples through. And by the end of it, I was like, well, I could keep on doing samples, but this could have been 12 pages of my own comic book that I could have been doing now. And then I'd have something that's mine that I can mm. use and show people. And so after that, I said, okay, well, I'm going to start doing my creator own thing, and then kind of went from there. Snowboard. Yeah. Do you think it's a misconception then that uh, being from South Africa, it's harder to break into the comics industry? Is it just tenacity that's getting you where you are? Or do you think there are structures in place that, that allow that to happen? I, th I think we're not as limited as we used to be. Mm. Like, it used to be like a lot harder when like, you didn't have the internet, and the only place you could get hired or get showcase your work was like at coins, and you had to go to a coin. Mm. But I think now with the internet and stuff, like if, if the driver is there and you're willing to work for it and put in the hours and realize that like at first you might not be like as good as you need to be mm -hmm. to get in, if you're, you can let your work speak for yourself and like don't be a douche on the internet and like create relationships with people. <laughs> don't and, be a jerk. Yeah, like just kind of, I mean that's how I got lucky, I just made relationships with people and even like certain people that would troll me, they'd sit and they'd go like, um, oh no, this character is exactly like this character. And I'm like, well, read the book and find out. I'm not going to fight with you on the internet about it. Mm. And that's how I met my collaborators, because we had like the same tastes and we liked the same mm. comics and we had like, ideas for the same stories. You, you mentioned CB. I mean, CB's job at that time was precisely that, wasn't it? He was a, a roving talent scout for Marvel. He would go to shows all over the world and just um, sample people's work and try to, uh, try to expand the Marvel stable. Well, Mike, let's talk a little bit about Lucifer, which was the spin-off of the much beloved Neil Gaiman Sandman. How did you get go get? How did you get that job? And was it daunting coming into Neil Gaiman's world? It, it, it should have been daunting. The only reason why it wasn't daunting was because it was so exciting. Because mm -hmm. I was a colossal Sandman fan, and it was it, it was a dream come true. It really was. I mean, it's a cliche, but, it, but that's what it was for me. Um, after the the Trident stuff, the the, um, the 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 British indie stuff that I did, all fell apart. Uh, I started trying out for American publishers. I did some work for Malibu. I did a couple of um, really, really bad uh, books based on rock stars. They, <laughs> they, 
they had um, they had an imprint called Rocket Comics, R O C K hyphen I T. Um, the you know the big sales gimmick was you got a free guitar. Pu- uh, plectrum thing <laughs> with, with, with each issue. So I did an Ozzy Osbourne comic for them, um, which wasn't too bad. And what I was it, the storyline? Uh, is Ozzy gets electrocuted by his own <laughs> by his own uh, <laughs> microphone or amplifier. Or something. So a normal and, once it been. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a day in the life. <laughs> and then he has to find his way back from the land of the dead and along the way he meets Randy Rhodes and... Uh, <laughs> oh. <laughs> But bad as that was, it, it pales into insignificance next to the Pantera comic I did. That <laughs> was... Oh no. Phil, Phil Anselmo came up with the story idea himself and sent, sent it to, to Malibu. And basically it was a four page um, pitch and they sent it on to me and it was, this, this was the pitch, practically verbatim. The, heavy, the, the, the great heavy metal band Pantera are performing one night when they get attacked by evil vampires. <laughs> and the evil vampires kidnap them and torture them. Next three and a half pages is a list of the tortures. <laughs> 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 they stick lighted matches under our fingernails, but do we flinch? No, we do not flinch. flinch. <laughs> <laughs> Because they're Pantera. <laughs> Absolutely. And then the last half pages, and then we, the, the, the band break free and kick vampire ass, and then they deliver this concert. So <laughs> I wrote the book. And, um, and then what a I, twist. I did a, did a whole bunch of stuff for, uh, for Calibre. And every, everything I did, the thing about Calibre, they didn't pay you, but they put, books, put out books that looked really good. It was good paper stock, really nice, uh, nice feel to it. Um, and I, I was sending it all to DC with begging letters saying, please let me work for you. Uh, and one day, I did, one of the books I did for Calibre was with Mike Perkins, the guy who did the art on The Stand, on the Marvel adaptation of The Stand, and he's done Captain America since then. Uh, he was, even back then, he was utterly amazing. We did a Dr. Faustus mm-hmm. a- adaptation. Uh, and Alisa Quitney, the Vertigo editor, picked it up off the slush pile. She was looking for a writer to take over mm-hmm. Sandman Presents Lucifer at the last moment because they, they had a writer. They commissioned the work and then they paid the other writer off. It was Elizabeth Hahn. I still don't know to this day why they didn't, why they didn't use her script. Uh, and she just called me up and said, do you want to do this? How badly do you want to do this? Because we need a script by next week. So I said, yeah, okay, I'll do that. I can do that. And of course, this was when you met uh, Peter Gross. And that's the start of your collaboration. Yes, which and was a life-changing experience. Yeah. Really. Tell me a bit, about, a bit more about that, because obviously you guys are busy with the Unwritten now. Yep, which um, is, yeah. And we're also planning our next, uh, our next outing. Um, with the first three issues of Lucifer were actually drawn, they, they, they were penciled by Chris Weston and they were inked by James Hodgkins and I thought we were in really good hand. You know, Chris especially is, is, a, is an amazing artist, but they hated each other. I mean, they really, really hated each other. Wow. Um, to the point where Chris was taking pages that James had inked, taking them back and, and re-inking from the original pencils wow, and so not weird. using James as well. And J- James said if he ever met Chris at a convention, he'd rip his head off um, <laughs> and punt it out of the window. Did, did J- they ever James, say James is that big and Chris is... Did, they ever, did, did you ever find out why they hate each other? Um, the, just some kind of stylistic thing. I mean, I think the relationship between pencilers and inkers is always a bit fraught, isn't it? Hi. <laughs> I don't know. I don't have an inker. Okay, there you go. <laughs> Like the, the ink is, is the that relationship the, with yourself a bit fraught over the ink. <laughs> just no, when the, when the pencil it, half, you hate the ink half. When, when the de- when deadline crunch comes around, yes, they don't get along. Eh? Mm. It's like the roughs look so good. Why does the finished work look so crap? Like pull your weight, man. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm a bit tired. <laughs> so we're, we're, we're three issues in, and they just turned around and walked in opposite directions. We lost our entire art team. Wow. Three issues in, and you know that's such a big part of your identity on the shelf. We thought we were dead. We really thought the book was dead. But it was around about the time when Books of Magic finished. Shelley said, I'm going to ask Peter. Uh, and she called Peter up and said, do you want to work on this, this book, Lucifer? And he said, not in a million years. <laughs> I've, I've just come off a 75-issue run on a fantasy book. You think I want to walk into another fantasy book right now? No, <laughs> thank you. Uh, but she sent, him, she sent him the script for issue four, which was uh, Born with the Dead. And he ended up not drawing that. Dean Ormston drew that. But he really liked the script and said, all right, I'll stay on for a few issues. And he, 75 he stayed, on, stayed on for the entire run and, and completely, you know, completely changed the book. It's hard to imagine what it would have been without him because it's, it's, his stamp is all over it. Um, you know, he's far, far more than just uh, uh, visualizing my scripts. He is, he is the storyteller as much as, I, as much as I am. And I learned a lot about storytelling from working with him. And, and, and on Unwritten, basically, 
the, the, the distinction drops altogether. You know, we, we plot it, uh, we plot it entirely as, as a team. And Sean, you've, uh, you are busy with uh, Stray, which is coming out next year, and uh, working with Vito Del Santo. So do you, do you think that this is your Vito, or you are his Vito? I don't know, it could be, mm. it could be. Like, uh, as we had, I mean, I'm, I met him like on, on Demon Dot. On Demon Dot, you get a lot of people coming in being like, Oh, I have this cool script and I need a collaborator, but I can't pay you and all this stuff. And it's like, I have to sit and explain to them, like, listen, while I'm working on your comic, how am I going to feed myself? How am I going to mm. keep a roof over my head type thing? Like, you need to pay me something. So that kind of like washes that out. But I, I met him because he didn't actually try to ask me to do stuff. He was like, Ah, oh, he did like this thing where it was kind of um, like, Re, like reboot a character once uh, like uh, for 30 days like 30 characters and, stuff. and one of them he said like listen can you I'll pay you just to come up with a design for this one and I did it and it was cool and um, he'd written by that time he'd written some some issues of um, uh, Batman Adventures for DC mm -hmm. Comics like the, the the animated version but in comic form and stuff mm -hmm. and he knew I liked Nightwing so she had Nightwing he said like if I want to do any test scripts like just draw it up for samples and stuff I can use his scripts so I said that was cool and um, that's where I kind of stumbled onto his, like onto Stray, which he actually was doing with another artist. But unfortunately that other artist was a bit busy and stuff. And because of the long, like lag, he asked if he, if he could sign it over to me and I could be the co-creator instead. So I said, like, that's fine. <clears throat> so we let him keep his designs, you know, because I mean, it's mostly his guys and stuff. And I kind of started from scratch and then we started collaborating on that. And so far it's been pretty awesome. And when you say you started from scratch with the character designs, so, is it you guys co uh, collaborating on what they're going to look like, the mm. costumes? Who's who comes up with the the look and the feel of the character? Well, when, like when we came up on, for, on scratch, I, I looked at the original design and I tried not to be influenced by that because he, he looked vastly different to the way he does now. And um, so I kind of just that's with that, that the designs is where I like, like to inject my own type of look into it. So with Stray, for example, when you the, the original design that the artist had for him. It was very much like a Rottweiler because mm -hmm. it was mostly black with like uh, like teeth as like an emblem on his chest and a little bit of orange on him and that. When I did it, uh, I based it off of my previous dog actually. His, des <laughs> his design is based on like the way my previous dog looked, okay, which no, no one knows until now. But it, basically I had a collie which was all black and he had like a brown mane with a white chest. And so when I, when I designed straight, I kind You're of... thinking of him. I, I used that design without anybody knowing and I kind of put that in there and it seemed to like click it just like the, it worked really well and everybody seems to love it it was like simple and not overly detailed kind of iconic mm -hmm. and I kind of try to keep that in mind when I'm designing characters as well like uh, you, I'll design I'll, I'll do a design I'll send it to Vito to like approve and see what he thinks and stuff and then just before I start drawing a page with that character and I'll be like no I think it sucks but it's, <laughs> it's balls I'm starting again and, I'll, and then like that page will get pushed back and I'll design it until I'm happy because I'm very anal with like designs. I want to make classic characters and like iconic and not like overly detailed ones that I'm going to struggle with every page. Well, with uh, you and Peter, where did the character of Tommy Taylor come about? How did he come about? Um, it, th there was a fairly sort of complicated genesis to Unwritten. Um, when, when, when we finished on Lucifer, even before we finished on Lucifer, we knew we wanted to work together again. Um, so we, we pitched loads and loads of stuff to Vertigo. We, I think we must have pitched about 30 different projects wow. in the space of a year and a half. Mm -hmm. And they all got uh, spiked. Actually, one of them got, got the green light. And then for no reason that we ever found out, they changed their minds um, after, just after I started the script and pulled us off it. Um, so we gave up. And Peter went away and did American Jesus with Mark Miller. I went away and did that stuff at Marvel. <laughs> that um, stuff. And... and uh, <laughs> And then we met, we met up again at San Diego in 2008, and Pornsack was there, Pornsack Bichette showed, the Vertigo editor, and we started talking, we started brainstorming some ideas. But Peter was obsessed with the idea of um, having the same story told twice, having the story of a little girl, both in real life and in, a, in a, a, a series of novels that her father is writing. And I had the idea of the, the magic trumpet, the trumpet that sounds the, end, the ending of one age of the world and the start of the, the next age. And my idea was just somebody blows the trumpet and everything changes except him. Uh, and he's trying to find the woman he used to be in love with who now has a completely different life and doesn't remember him. Um, and Pornsek said, you know, put them in the same story. Yeah, just just, just uh, throw them in together and mix it up. And we did. And the other thing that we mixed in was um, Christopher Robin, mm -hmm. Christopher Robin Milne. 
because I was reading The Enchanted Places, which is the first volume of his, his autobiography, where he talks about the, um, the incredible burden of growing up as somebody else's fictional character and how he hated what his father had done to his childhood. Um, so that becomes, that becomes Tommy. You know, Tommy is, is that character. If, if his dad had written the Harry Potter books instead of Winnie the Pooh. Mm. Well, I was explaining uh, to one of my colleagues uh, what The Unwritten is about, and I was saying, well, basically, it's written for booksellers and people who love literature, because it's just stories within stories within stories. And, um, yeah, I mean, like, that, I suppose, your, is this where your, your teaching and your literature background came into? All these things were you waiting to put into a comic? I didn't know I was waiting to do it, but, but yeah, I'm, I'm written as kind of our love letter to the stories that made us. I mean, it, it, it's, a, it's very much a story about why stories matter. There's a, there's a bit in the first issue where the, uh, the vampire, Count Ambrosio, uh, Tom, Tom says, don't kill me for a story, and, and Ambrosio goes ape and says, you know, um, stories are the only things worth dying for. You know, try, try telling Sacco and Vanzetti is not worth dying for a story. Try telling the witches of Salem is not worth dying for a story. Everyone dies for a story. Um, and that's, that's, that's kind of what we feel, you know. Um, everything in life that matters is a narrative of some, some form or other. Our religions are based on story, uh, our, our political opinions, your sense of, a, of the nation that you belong to, of, the, of your family, of your, your, your whole identity. It's stories that you tell yourself. Um, there's a thing in social psychology called the observer effect, or the, the bystander effect, which is where um, they, 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 get, they get an unwitting person to, to witness a crime, and the question is, will they report it, or will they just sort of stand by and do nothing? And it matters whether you're on your own when you see it, or, or there's somebody else there. Oh, I've heard about that. Yeah. If there's somebody else there and they do nothing, you do nothing. Uh, if you're by yourself, you're more likely to intervene. And there are all sorts of experiments like that that suggest that actually there isn't a stable core to who we are and what we do. We, we, we respond to situation. We're essentially reactive creatures. Uh, and we change, therefore, as we go from one situation to the next. So what is your sense of self? Your sense of self is the story you tell yourself that links all of those situations together. So we are, we are stories. We are such things as dreams are made of. Mm. And, um, well, like with uh, uh, Sean, mm. you, how did, you were talking about how you got to Pathfinder game. Mm. And now this is uh, comics that are based on, on a role-playing game. Yes. So it's, based, it's very interactive in terms of, with the storyline, how do they come up with those storylines? Um, well, the thing is, I think, like Dynamite, they, they do a lot of licensed products. Mm -hmm. So um, they pretty much just get, I'm not quite sure how, what the process is, but you, uh, Jim Zub, he's the, the main writer on it. And he just, he, he pretty much, I think, from what I know, he just kind of goes to Paizo, who are the guys that do the Pathfinder books, the Pathfinder role-playing game, and like, gets it approved that way. It's like, he wants to do this with these characters. And mm -hmm. his writing is also very character-driven. So it'll be like a, a situation that you might be familiar with, but the thing you want to read about mm -hmm. is how those characters react. So, for example, um, before, it, it wasn't actually said until now in, in Pathfinder, one of the female characters, uh, she's a lesbian. I read that one recently, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> and he, like, he, when he pitched that to them, they were like, oh, that's really cool because uh, the Pathfinder world is the first role-playing game, sort of, where they've like, no, 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 un unless we stay otherwise, like the characters, the characters that, are in, that are in these books can go either way. Mm -hmm. You know, and so he said, well, let's do this. And it seems people responded really well to it. So it's quite fun. And um, in terms of the character, character designs for that, uh, did you get like a very specific brief, how they look, what, I suppose, because there's already a template that exists? Yeah, there, there is. The thing is, like, um, I, Friday nights I do role playing games with friends at home. Mm -hmm. I guess my, like, Friday night I'm off work and I'm going to go and I'm going to sit around the table and roll some dice with some friends. Like, it's a nice social thing. And so we play Pathfinder. So when I got the gig, I was like, oh, okay, I know what these characters look like already because I've got all the books that have them in it, all the role playing books. Um, but they were originally designed by uh, Wayne Reynolds, and he's like a, he's a painter, and he puts so much detail into his into his art. So I'm sitting there now. When I had to do when I got the gig, I had to do samples of the characters to see that I could get the likeness right and the designs. And you're sitting there going, and there's like layers and layers of these characters, and I'm like, okay, cool. I'm taking all these patches off because I, I can't spend like capes? six do you like hours. Capes? <laughs> capes. You know what the thing is? I was actually it's funny as bringing it up because like the other day I was saying I haven't perfected the way I want to draw capes. 
because everybody has these like a signature, signature style, style to capes. So you look at like John Byrne's capes and you look at like Todd McFarlane and how he draws capes and stuff. There's very different ways to draw capes and I haven't actually nailed down how I want to draw capes yet. Because I haven't drawn them enough. McFarlane's capes are about 40 feet long. Jeez. <laughs> I'm surprised the guy that those characters can get off the roof. <laughs> yeah, so uh, yeah. What about the tattoos? Is one, of, one of the female characters has a really complicated... So many tattoo. complicated tattoos. Now originally when I drew the first couple of issues, um, I would sit there and I, I would zoom in to try and draw all those, all those tattoos and stuff because you do the outline and stuff. So now with um, recently I had to do um, some fill-in pages for an issue and I was like, okay, I can't, I can't sit and draw the whole like, outline of it. So I worked out that I'm going to draw everything black and white and then like those little details, I'm going to do like, you know, you know grey. So when I send the actual file to the colorist, all he has to do is just select the grey and it's all done. So I can just kind of do a squiggle and whatever and save myself some time. But it's stuff that you learn through the, through the process. You're like, okay, well, I can find a shortcut to do this and a shortcut to do that. Mm -hmm. And in terms of the way the characters look and move, your, your art has a very palpable sense of movement, but without it being outrageous. You know, like with the uh, Milo Minara uh, Spider-Woman cover, where everyone was out the, the outcry over the way that she was positioned. Because it looks like it's not something that a human body can actually do. So even though we're in superheroes, we still want it to look like it's something that a human body can do. Strangely enough, I saw a reference picture that looks exactly like that, that Milo yeah, Minara yeah. picture. It was like a photo of um, this uh, Asian woman, because it's a reference book that I was using. And I was paging through it and I was like, wait a second, that's the exact same okay. pose. And I'm like, okay, no, it does look like it actually could work. So the people that were freaking out were like, they should probably see this, because Milo Minara might have been using this reference picture, mm. and he just didn't want to tell anybody. Like, you don't know. <laughs> the, 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 the problem is that it was a porn pose. You know, mm -hmm. it, it, but the thing is, I kind of understand though, like, I mean, I can understand why people are getting pissed off, but it is Milo Minara, and that's his style. It's always been his style. Yeah. And I mean, it's also not the, it's not the regular cover. So if someone really wants to get it, they've got to like, really, really work to get it. Yeah. it. It was the decision that Marvel had made. I mean, that, yeah. was, that was the controversial thing, yes. that, they, that they brought Minara in, knowing what he would do with, with, with a female character on the cover. Well, well, exactly. This also leads into the role of editors, because it's the Marvel editors that make that decision with the covers. Um, I mean, with the jobs that you guys do, at the end of the day, you is the editor in control, or who has? How does it all come together then, with the illustrators, the writers, and the editor? In in, um, in the case of a franchise book like X Men, the editor is colossally important because you know, you, you're using characters who exist in five or six other books at the same time, and somebody has to coordinate what's happening in their lives. Um, so the editors have that sort of all-important all lynch linchpin role. And there are some things that you just can't do. You mm. can't do them because decisions have been made in advance about where a character is going to be or what's going to happen to them in their life. Um, I, I, wrote, I wrote the story in which Rogue gets conscious control of her powers after 40-odd years, um, about 30-odd years, uh, of, uh, of automatically absorbing the powers of anyone she touched. Um, and that took a lot of clearance. You know, Nick liked the story, Daniel Ketchum, who was my other editor, liked the story, but they had to go to Axel, who was the senior editor at the X office, and he had to talk to um, Tom Brevoort. A lot of people had to sign off on that before I could write the story. Uh, whereas, whereas if you do create your own stuff, mm, um, then you, you are. You, you're you're I, I feel so bad for Tom, eh? When you see him on Twitter, yes, the poor, people ask him, they give him so much crap. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like, I, I actually went and I mentioned to him, I'm like, listen, I, I, like, you need a beer for every person that trolls you and gives you grief. Because he's always, like, so, so polite and kind of, he gets, a, he gets a little snarky sometimes, which is quite funny, and I just, like, laugh. But I just, like, these people, hey, well, I feel when, for him, man. When we were working on uh, Messiah Complex, which is the first big X-Men crossover that I did, um, we, they, they flew all of the editors and all of the writers out to, to LA, to Marvel West, to brainstorm the story. So we're in a room full of people who are writing X Men books. Was that the retreat? The retreat, oh, yeah. Man, I, want to go, I want to go to one of those schools. I want to go and oh, I want to go there and be like, wow, guys, that's so awesome. We got to this point where we knew we wanted Cable and Bishop to be in the story. Um, and we wanted them to, to be on opposite sides of the battle because they come from different futures where the same events have had different outcomes. And we thought, actually, Nobody here knows whether they come from like the same timeline or different timelines and whether they're like the same distance in the future or one of them was many, many centuries later than the other. And we were sitting around looking helplessly, helplessly at each other and Axel Alonso turned to Nick and said, call Tom, call Tom Brevo. He's the only one in the, in the entire company who will just be able to tell you off the top of his head the answer to that question, and he did. Well, I mean, in terms of the continuity, being able to keep track of all these things that happen. And I know you've said previously that before you started with the X-Men gig, 
you had to consume a vast quantity of back issues to just get up to speed in terms yeah. of what's happening, where it's going. Um, so I suppose research is such a huge, important part of the role that you that you're going to create there. It definitely is. Yeah, if you again, if you're working on a franchise book, a company-owned book, and that, that, that's kind of the weird thing about writing in comics that most of the work you do is work for hire. It's, it's work on characters that somebody else has created, mm. and you're just you're just curating the characters. It, it, it it's. What, what that brought that home to me was when I, I, I'd written for Vertigo for many years before I did X-Men and Vertigo had a message board and if you're lucky maybe 12 people would show up to say like the latest issue or more usually hated the latest issue <laughs> um, but it was just, it was just a, a small bunch of people you knew them all by name and then I start, even before I started writing X-Men when I was announced on X-Men there were people, hundreds, thousands of people showing up on CBR saying you better not do this with Sabretooth you better, you better, you better not forget such and such a story. Um, and you realize that these people, their relationship with the characters predates yours and will go on longer than yours. You know, they, they love the characters before you come on the book. They'll carry on following those characters after you leave. And so you kind of have to be aware. Uh, Nick said to me, every single thing you do will be some, some fan's worst nightmare and some fan's greatest dream. Just get used to it. No, it's true. Like, I mean, look at that, what Dan Schlott does with Spidey before he did um, Superior. And then they were like, oh, Dr. Octopus has taken over Spider-Man's mind and people lost their minds over that and were so angry until they started reading the actual series and then it was the best thing they've read. It was like some people that have never read Spider-Man in a while were like, that's the best run I've ever had. So you kind of just have to sit there and be like, you know what, I'm going to push through and once they've read it, if they hate it, fine. You know? I, I got death threats when I... When I, um, <laughs> oh, when, when, I, when I brought Rogue and Magneto together, when I, I had them kiss... A couple, of, a couple, of, a couple of people. As, as, <laughs> as, as if they didn't, as if they didn't do that in yeah, the nineties. <laughs> they did that in the nineties, so I don't know why doing it again is such a well, big that, problem. That, that's what I thought. It's canonical, so yeah. I, I didn't expect the reaction I got. But a couple of people said on the message board, "If you ever come to my hometown, I'm going to find you and I'm going to kill you." <laughs> I'd like to get death threats. I'm like, come to South Africa. You guys are going to cuck. <laughs> <laughs> I want to hear a little bit about your uh, work procedures. Um, Sean, the way that you talk about, I, I can't conceive of the time that it must go in to creating uh, pages. Mm -hmm. um, how do you quantify that? I mean, how do you charge for that? How, I mean, how many hours a day do you draw? On average, uh, like, okay, my average day, it's, it's very simple. It's like I wake up at opposite nine in the morning, start work at about 10, <laughs> take a break at about, I think like, one o'clock for like a 20 minute power nap, take a break at like six for like dinner, have maybe another power nap, and then I work until about half past three in the morning. Oh. That is amazingly structured. <laughs> <laughs> I need That's some structure, I need, I need structure, <laughs> power naps man, it's the best. You can ask any of my friends, I always, I'm always saying to them, I'm like, naps are the best, and then I pass out. <laughs> um, and I, I, I put out about like quality pages, pages that I'm happy with, I can do maybe like four a week. Um, obviously, sometimes if a page is simpler, it'll be a bit more, or if I push a bit harder, I can then push to like five or six pages if I really have to, or if deadline is hectic. Um, but generally, like a, a page will take me like a day and a half, so I work like maybe 17 hours a day or something like that. And I mean, I, I put in like a lot of hours, but I love it though. Like, I mean, it's, it's uh, like some like I uh, people say, do I miss the nine to five job where I can go? And I'm like, no, not really, because you know, I, I get to work in my pajamas. So that's, that's a big plus, you know, I don't have to sit in traffic and all that type of thing. And um, I love creating and like I have stories to tell that I want, people, want, want to share with people. That's kind of the joy of making comics. And then Mike, how is your structure? I have no structure. Have no I have no structure. <laughs> <laughs> writers, man, there writers. No <laughs> there's no naps. There's a lot, there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of wasted time. I, re I spend my days ricocheting off things. Uh, I get up early and I, 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 I start early and I finish late. But in, the, in between, I could be doing anything. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll waste two hours playing Sonic the Hedgehog. I honestly, I, I, honestly I should do. be a writer. Clearly, they have it easier. Like, I'm gonna sit and play. My Xbox has dust on it. Um, I, I, I just, yeah, I, 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 every day is different. I work, I get distracted, I look out the window, um, I make a cup of tea, I make another cup of tea, and then I go back to work. Lots of tea. Yeah, yeah. lots of tea. Same here, lots of tea. It must always be tea bags. How do you guys get done, things done with the internet? The internet, I find, is the great harbinger of doom and productivity. The, the other day was the first time I turned off my phone and lost it for like an hour and a half. And then I was like, what's happening on Twitter? 
I, I, I turned down the volume uh, on, on my speakers because you, if you can't hear a tweet coming in or, or a message coming in on Facebook, then you forget about it. It drifts into the background. But yeah, it's, it's, it's fatal to, uh, to get into an online chat in the middle of the day. Your whole life can fall into that hole. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And quickly, before we run out of time, I want to hear a bit about what you guys have planned for the future. What are your projects that you are both excited, well, that you're excited about and coming up next? Um, well, I've got um, a quarter of the way through issue three of Stray, um, so hopefully issue four will be done by end of November. Um, at the moment, I'm busy kind of looking to see what I'm going to do next, because we've got Stray is planned as uh, five volumes. We have just a bunch of mini-series. Uh, first, first one is four issues, second one probably about six. Um, but as an artist, I like to like challenge myself and try something new, because I, I never like to use the same style on each book. So you have my Pathfinder stuff, it's a bit more like scratchy and detailed and stuff, whereas like superhero stuff, I try to keep clean and heroic and stuff. So um, I want to do projects in between each volume of Stray. So at the moment, I'm kind of looking at maybe collaborating with a creator owned, on a creator owned book. At the moment, I've got um, the writer of uh, Pathfinder, Jim Zub, has sent me some stuff and we're kind of talking about if we're going to do something or not and kind of see from there. So it'll probably take a while before I figure out. But hopefully I'll have something set up by the time I finish issue four of Stray. Um, pretty much everything I'm doing is coming to an end uh, this year or next year. Suicide Risk has only got, uh, I've got five more scripts to deliver on that. I've got only one more script to deliver on unwritten. On, on um, the only thing I know is going to happen is that Peter and I are going to work together again. We're, 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 pitching, we're already pitching ideas. We've got some interest from a French publisher uh, in, in, a, in a project, which the, 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 the big brainwave is that uh, French books have a completely different page uh, format to American mm -hmm. books. But Peter has been fully digital for three or four years now. And he thinks that if we can do it for, for a French format and then he can re restack the panels mm -hmm. and adapt it for an American uh, publisher as well. So we could do the book simultaneously for Edition Glenard in France and for maybe Image or IDW um, in, in America. Uh, apart from that, uh, there's no, no other comics that I've definitely got sort of on the slate at the moment. I'm doing a TV series, I'm doing a couple of movie adaptations. Um, Are you going to be at all involved with the Lucifer pilot? I, 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 I found out about that at the same time everybody else <laughs> did, um, that the, the Fox had put it out to pilot. I, I, I don't even know if they're going to draw on my stories, oh, wow. because okay. um, obviously Lucifer originates in Sandman. Mm -hmm. there's, there's a version of that story that never goes near mm -hmm. what I wrote. Presumably Neil is involved, because yeah. he's, he's a stakeholder, he owns half the copyright. Um, but I'm intensely curious as to what they're going to do with that. Well, if the seasons run long enough, eventually they'll have, they'll have to draw more material, so they'll get your stuff. That, that, would, be, that would be cool. I, I, I hope they do. And then you're like, oh, listen, can I have some of that royalty? <laughs> um, I think that's a good time to take, see if anyone has any questions. Questions? At the back? Um, was there any one title when you started reading, like reading comics and stuff that you really, what was the first comic that you fell in love with? Probably for me, it was that, that Leo Baxendale book, Wham! That was the first comic I loved, and I still love it, um, even though it's, it's, it's preposterously dated now. I, I, I bought some um, uh, back issues of it. I've got a little stack of them at home. Uh, it was so cheaply produced, only the cover, only the front and back cover were in color. Everything else was black and white. Really cheap and nasty, but it was a lovely book. Um, and the first American comic book that I fell in love with was Fantastic Four, the Stan Lee, Jack Kirby, Fantastic Four. My brother bought me the annual where Reed Richards is trapped in the negative zone and they send Triton of the Inhumans in to get him. What? Oh, I love that stuff. Of all people, Triton. <laughs> because he can navigate in the void, you see. It's like an ocean. Oh, now I know the use for that character. I never quite got him. That actually brings up something and I, was, I came across this list of the five weirdest ways that comic book characters were taken out. And Doctor Doom got taken out by Squirrel Girl. Squirrel Girl. No, but that, that What's the most ridiculous character that you think exists in comics? Ridiculous character. I, okay, how about, uh, he's not around anymore, but Metamorpho, the element man? He was, he was pretty damn preposterous, wasn't he? he his, his body was in quarters, each of them was meant to be a different uh, chemical element. I don't know, for me it'd probably be Lobo, eh? Lobo. Lobo, I mean, he's, he's literally just a parody of a certain type of character. Mm. And I'm like, hmm, okay. I don't find fascination then. Um, first title that I, that I fell in love with was Teen Titans. Mm -hmm. Teen Titans, it was like, you know, characters like out of my age, 
going on adventures. And they're, they're, like, I love their, their um, interpersonal like, relationships. That's what I love the most. And also the, my, my, favorite, my favorite issue was the one where um, Deathstroke takes out every single one of the Teen Titans and uh, Dick Grayson, Robin, was the only one that gets away and he doesn't have any powers. And I'm like, yeah, man, he's badass. <laughs> there, there, there was a, a variation on that when uh, in Public Enemy, uh, the, the Mark Miller Wolverine uh, oh, yes, series, yes. the bit where he invades the Baxter building, and there's only one of the Fantastic Four that he's even remotely scared of, and it's Sue. Oh, but Sue's, <laughs> Sue is hardcore. Yeah, she's she is. so powerful. My, and, she, being... and she almost stops him. She actually creates an invisible force field inside his lungs and says, you know, I can expand these uh, in, in a heartbeat. If you ever want to breathe again, stand down. No, no, my favorite episode issue of that, because I also read Public Enemy, was where he, he tries to take out Daredevil. And, De- and he's sitting he's looking over Daredevil and he's like, this guy hooks up with more chicks than me. Like, he can't believe it. Like that, and then like Daredevil's dodging Wolverine trying to kill him and a bunch of ninjas. And I'm like, and I'm like yeah, Daredevil, he's hardcore, man. He might be blind, but he's, he's, he's awesome. Like, I can't wait for the Netflix series. Mm. Cannot wait for that. Any Anything else? The bathroom? Uh, two questions. Uh, um, I normally go in with a sense of the beginning and the ending, and with a, with a, with a clear sense of the beginning and the ending, and a very fuzzy sense of what might happen in the middle. You know, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of things that, that are just serendipitous in a, in a, in a monthly book that kind of have to be. Um, but, you, but you do have to know what your, what your climax is going to be what the payoff is going to be for your major characters. How then do you navigate if something gets cancelled? Like I mentioned to you how much I loved Crossing, Crossing Midnight. Crossing Midnight, yeah. Which it seems like I was the only person who read it. Anyone read Crossing Midnight? You probably Midnight? were, that's why it was cancelled. It's awesome, guys. <laughs> I, have to, I have to check it out though. And the way it really ends, I'm like, no. So tell me what you had planned next. <laughs> well, it, it, was all, it was always going to end with that war, uh-huh. with, with the, uh, the Great Yokai War, but, uh, but there were going to be like... Uh, a hundred more characters involved. It was going to, it was going to, it was going to uh, go through. The, the, the twins were going to meet many, many more um, of those the, those supernatural characters. And by the time we got to the war and to the involvement of the death gods, there would have been so much more at stake. Um, what happened there was Paul, uh, Paul Levitt saved it. It got to 19 issues. They were going to cancel it at the end of the first year. And Paul Levitt said, actually, I like this book. Let's keep it going for a while, even though they were making a loss on every issue. So we got to go to 19, and we did, we did manage to, to wrap the story yeah. up, although it was, uh, it was a kind of truncated, um, crumpled version of what it could have been. That was, that was, it's it's that nice was when you get really those extra couple depressing. of issues just to kind of try and tie it up at least instead of just... Yeah, rather, rather than just dropping into a void. But we did everything wrong on that book. I think what you have to do, the marketplace is so competitive these days, if you don't set your stall out in your first issue, people don't come back for issue two. And it was a slow burn. You know, it, took, it took a long time before people knew where it was going. And now with Unwritten, you've had the time to plan how it's all going to end. Yes. And uh, so does that give you a nice sense of completion that you can put the finishing touch, touches to it? It really does, yeah. It, it's, uh, it's exactly the book we wanted it to be, in the same way that Lucifer was exactly the book we wanted it to be. Um, and that's never, never automatic. Unwritten sells very low numbers. The trades saved unwritten uh, because it, it sells respectively in trades. Uh, the, the figures for the monthly book are quite, quite, quite appalling. Is, is Suicide Risk not an ongoing, was it? No, it wraps, it wraps up with issue 25. Is it? Because I've been wanting to dig into that, but uh, I'll go to the comic shop, I'm like, yeah, like, oh, they don't have any stock. What? So I'm like, should I wait for an omnibus? Will they make one? <laughs> the, 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 I think there are, the, there are going to be like five or six trades when, when, when it's all done. Oh, okay. um, but no, it's, 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 it's really appalling when, uh, when, you, when, you, when you're cut off in, in mid-flow. It's, it's, it's bad, for, bad for the readers and it's bad for the writers. It's like you've got this unfinished business hanging over you forever. I met Terry Dodson in between um, issue three and issue four of the, you know, that Spider-Man Black Cat thing. Mm-hmm. The third issue that ends where she's about to be raped. Yes. And it was, I don't know how many years it was before he got to write the end because. Um, it was, was like three, wasn't it? It was Kevin Smith. It was Kevin Smith and Terry Dodson, yeah. And, and, and Kevin Smith went away and made movies and trivial stuff like that. He tends, he tends, he tends to do that. He's like, I've got a great idea for a comic, but there's this movie I want to make that's really cool, so I'll do that and I'll come back. And Terry Dodson spent those three years in a state of um, ba- basically heightened emotional tension. Every time he went to a show, people would say, when's the fourth issue coming out? I don't know, I don't know when it's coming out. <laughs> <We're waiting. laughs>
Um, there's a huge difference. I mean, everything comes down to individuals, so, so um, it's, it's dangerous to generalize. Uh, your relationship with a given editor is a, is, is a unique thing. But having said that, DC is rule-bound in a way that Marvel isn't. When you pitch to DC, it goes to an editor, it goes to a senior editor, it goes to a group editor, it goes to one of the three publishers, uh, and you've got to tick all those boxes before it gets approved. Um, that can take a year. Wow. Marvel, you pitch something, they say, hmm, that sounds like a good book. Salvador La Roca could draw that. And the next thing you know, it's in previews. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Mar 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 Marvel fly one inch above the road. They really do. And it's great. I mean, it works I, for them, eh? It does, yeah. I, mean, I, I love Vertigo. I love the people at Vertigo. And I think as an imprint, it's, it's done things that no, no other comics publisher has. But there's no denying that Marvel is, it, the, the, the processes of Marvel are a lot easier and, and more transparent. I kind of picture them like sitting around, like having a beer, like being like, okay, so let's check out pictures, guys. <laughs> Did anyone order the pizza? <laughs> Dynamite, have you met Nick Barucci? Or have I haven't, no. Yeah. I've only sp spoken to uh, Richie Young, that's pretty much it. The guy in charge of Dynamite, everyone thinks he must be mob connected. <laughs> he's, this, he's this huge Italian-American with rings that are like gold, gold ingots. <laughs> and, and he's always flying between America and England, even though he doesn't particularly work with British creators, but he, he, he does that trip like three times a month or something. So everyone thinks he must be working rackets. <laughs> well, that'd be kind of cool. Like, you'd have to be like, oh, okay, makes sense. Anything else? Yeah, all good. Uh, for Mike, in Lucifer, um, the character of Mazakin, when you wrote her, I've always found her a very fascinating character, but I also find myself, like, when she speaks, when she's got off the base. It's quite hard to understand. And, and you've actually written it, so you have to speak out loud. <laughs> <laughs> How did you write that? Did you actually sort of get someone to say, okay, I'm just going to tape up on your mouth and I'll speak saying his line? No, I, I sat at the keyboard going ruff, 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 <laughs> <laughs> and then trans, transcribed it. Uh, but, but I inherited that from Neil. That was Neil who, uh, who was responsible for that. I, I actually, at a certain point, I gave her another, the other half of her face back just so that people could understand what she was saying. <laughs> it's like, yeah, this guy, you can have, you can have your face back it's just so that people understand. That's all. Yeah, um, Lucifer was yeah was was built within that framework that Neil created, and that that, that was yeah you know, what I, what I loved about it that uh, he created this mythology that was big enough to include all the mythologies and religions of the world. He created a stage where angels from the Judeo-Christian uh, mythology could talk to Japanese storm gods and Navajo tribal gods, and it made sense. Okay, last question. Mike, with editorial meetings, you did you have any time when you wanted to do something and the editorial came back and just said, no, you can't take the character in that direction or you can't do this? And did you um, recall any of those instances? It, ha it happened a fair few times on X-Men, you know, for very good reason. Um, I did a story, or I planned the story with uh, Cassandra Nova in it, who was my favorite villain from the Grant Morrison run. And I was quite a long way into it when Nick phoned me and said, she's going to be in um, Joss Whedon's Astonishing, so you can't have her. Damn you, Joss Whedon! Damn it, Joss! <laughs> this is and why they cancelled Firefly. <laughs> Come on! <laughs> and I was going to use Rose Walker in Sandman, and Neil said um, if if he ever came back to Sandman, the story of Rose's pregnancy was the one that he wanted to resolve. So he just said, "I'd rather you didn't. I'd rather you didn't use her." I think that's a good place to stop. Uh, uh, Michael is, will be doing a signing at the Reader's Day and Table downstairs. So please come get your comic signed. And also remember that Open Book Festival and the Book Lounge, we have a library project. We build a library for underprivileged school. This year it is Westridge in Mitchell's Plain. So maybe even buy them a comic if you want. Get them started young. Okay. <laughs> we read comics. Yeah, we're going to be comics. Young Avengers, all sorts of things, yeah. Okay, thanks Mike. Thank